Hi everyone, my name is Caitlin Yeager, Director of Heritage Programs for Missouri Humanities. Uh, I apologize for the delay in start. We were having some technical difficulties. Hopefully the rest of the program will go smoothly. Um, please comment if you guys have any issues and we'll try and resolve them, but uh, here we go. Um, we are uh, Missouri Humanities, a member supported organization. Our mission is to enrich lives and strengthen communities by connecting Missourians with the people, places, and ideas that shape our society. Thank you for joining us for chapter eight of this 10 part virtual storytelling journey that brings the book Growing Up With The River, Nine Generations on the Missouri to life. Growing Up With The River by Dan and Connie Burkhart explores our, rich, our state's rich cultural heritage through the eyes of nine generations of children growing up in river towns along the Missouri River. Each of the 10 chapters will be presented by a storyteller and special guests. The series will run every Wednesday at 4 p.m. on Facebook Live, ending on September 30th. Today, we will explore Augusta in 1930 or 1986. Augusta's hillsides had been filled with vineyards until prohibition arrived in 1920, and most of the grapevines were destroyed. In the 1960s, Missouri wineries began planting grapes again. The closing of the Katy Railroad in 1984 offered yet another opportunity for a new chapter in the life of the town. I'd like to introduce our storyteller for this afternoon, Sherry Norfolk. Sherry is an award-winning storyteller, author, and teaching artist who performs and presents nationally and internationally. She's a Kennedy Center national teaching artist, a Wolf Trap teaching artist, a young audiences teaching artist and adjunct professor at Leslie University and is a recognized leader in arts integration. After Sherry's narration, we will introduce our special guests. Before we begin, we would like to thank Dan and Connie Burkhart for writing such a wonderful book and for entrusting us to share these stories. And also thanks to Brian Haynes for allowing us to share his beautiful illustrations. Please let us know you're watching by asking questions and leaving comments. And in partnership with the Higher Education Channel, HEC-TV, St. Louis Storytelling Festival, Missouri History Museum, and Magnificent Missouri, we present Growing Up with the River. This was it, the big day that all the adults had been talking about before the boys went to bed last night. The first harvest and great crush of the season. They weren't really supposed to be in the wine cellar, but they had just left the workers out in the vineyard who were bringing in the grapes. In an hour or two, the trucks would be rolling in, piled with juicy, sticky loads of just picked fruit, surrounded by the busy hum of the bees. But in the meantime, things were quiet, and the boys had the wine cellars to themselves everywhere. Single, lingo, 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 footsteps, step, step, echo, load, 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 shh. They pretended to be spies on a mission in an underground world. It smelled so musty down there. The cellars had been dug by hand in 1881 and had been in use ever since. Even though there was bright sunlight outside, they needed a flashlight to see. They waved the light across the stones and brick ceilings, hunting for the salamanders and small lizards that loved the cool, damp cellars. Lizard hunting was a pretty popular pastime in Augusta, Missouri in 1986, so they had spent many hours in the dark, stuffy cellars. The twins knew just where to look. They wished there were more going on, like trains coming through the town again. The Kitty Railroad tracks ran along the river bluff and next to the farm fields in the river bottom below the town. But there were no trains. Their parents said that the trains used to stop to drop off and pick up all sorts of goods. The twins couldn't remember those days and just had to pretend that trains were still rolling past the town. They walked along the tracks, jumping from one railroad tie to the next and made their own train whistle sounds. <laughs> Supposedly, there were too many floods and not enough business for the railroad. That was bad news for the railroad in the river valley, but good news for kids who wanted to use the railroad as a place to dream and think about where those tracks had taken people. 
One Sunday at breakfast, Dad snapped the newspaper open and said, hey, everybody, listen to this. He sounded so excited that the twins and mom all paid attention. Says here that someone has a new idea for the old Katy Railroad tracks. He wants to buy up the whole railroad and pull up all the rails and cross ties. He wants to build a trail where you could ride your bikes from one railroad town to the next and make it the longest bike path in America. Maybe it'll happen and maybe it won't. The boys knew that dad was disappointed because he wanted to see a train that would just take tourists back and forth from St. Louis to Augusta. But to them, a bike ride really sounded better. They weren't listening to the rest of dad's story. They were just trying to imagine how someone make, would make a trail. How would they pick up the railroad ties that had been there for a hundred years? What would happen to the bridges? Could they really ride their bikes all the way to Marthasville? That sounded like a lot more fun than lizard hunting in the wine cellars. Dad was still reading the paper. Listen to this, says here in the Post-Dispatch. If things go as planned, St. Louisans could park near the old Katy tracks at St. Charles, mount their bicycles, and pedal to Sedalia on the western side of the state. Right now, this is only a dream, several years from, from completion. Much must be done before Missourians can have one of the finest hiking and biking trails in the country. The problem was that nothing like this had ever been done in Missouri before. Some people loved it and some people didn't like it one bit. People who lived near the tracks worried that visitors on the trail would bother them or their farm animals. They could imagine a lot of problems the trail might cause. On the other hand, bikers and hikers were enthusiastic. Now, these days, if the twi twins wanted to ride along the edge of Highway 94, they had to hope that drivers were paying attention. Having a trail just for bikes with no cars was a brand new idea. Maybe if they could, they would ride their bikes all the way to the old chemical plant and explore all the dangerous things there. They passed it whenever they drove on Highway 94 to St. Louis. The empty factory buildings were rusting and falling down and their parents said that the factory used to build things for war. Cool, said one of the twins. No, not cool, said mom. The government worked with radium and uranium there, really dangerous chemicals. We're just hoping that someone knows what to do with those dilapidated buildings and how to solve the problem. The chemicals are dangerous for people. The boys kept quiet but grinned at each other. It was like a science fiction movie in real life, close to home. One morning, dad read the articles about the old chemical plant at Weldon Springs at the breakfast table. Listen to this. Weldon Spring plant may be super fun site. What's that? The twins asked in unison. Super money? Sort of, just listen. The Environmental Protection Agency proposed on Thursday making the entire Ar Army Ordnance Works at Weldon Spring a Superfund site for federal cleanup. The action means that the entire 17,000 acre former munitions plant is a candidate for cleanup rather than just those portions where remedial action is either underway or planned. I see where the Superfund bit comes in, Mom said. Cleaning up that entire 17,000 acre mess will take a lot of money. What's out there, Mom? One of the boys asked. I mean, besides the tons of uranium and radium junk they've already begun to clean up already. Well, I know they've discovered chemicals from processing TNT and DNT during World War II, Mom answered. She turned to Dad. He grinned. You remember hearing back during the 1960s? Teenagers used to dare each other to swim in the quarry. There were huge spooky living carp living down in that quarry. They would rise slowly up from the darkness where you couldn't see. And weird looking frogs with bumps where they shouldn't have had bumps. Scary. Gross, is that true? The boys demanded. His parents nodded their heads. Unfortunately, yes, it's true. That place is no joke. The twins were even more intrigued now. They were brave. They had to explore this place with its big keep out sign someday. They could earn a special exploration badge for Boy Scouts. Just yesterday, 
They worked all day on a Boy Scout project. They were building bluebird boxes so the Missouri State Bird would have places to build their nests in the spring. It was almost like the bluebirds knew they were famous in Missouri. There were more and more of them every year. A lot of the dads were happy that the woods were filled with wild turkeys and deer so they could go hunting. Their dad was a nature lover, but he didn't hunt. He was content observing the birds and their habits, and he was thrilled to see so many bluebirds along the edges of the fields. He explained that, like most birds and animals, they knew the best place to live, and for bluebirds, it was a hole in a tree. But as farm fields got bigger and trees between the fields were taken out, the beautiful birds lost many of their favorite nesting places. Putting up the bluebird boxes was the next best thing, and the bluebirds seemed to love them. The scout leader told the troop that bluebirds were coming back to the river valley for a couple of reasons. First, they loved to nest around vineyards. Every year, more grapevines were being planted in Augusta, and the bluebirds noticed, and all they needed was a box. Fortunately, someone had designed the right kind of box for bluebirds to call home, and it was easy to build. As Dad said, if we give it a chance, nature will come back. Many people in town had started to put up nesting boxes along the edges of fields and yards. The twins liked to carefully lift the lid on the nest box to check on the birds. Sometimes the mother bird would just sit there and stare at them. But more often the baby birds would look up with their big yellow mouths wide open, waiting for mother bird to feed them. One winged creature that had plenty of food was the monarch butterfly. This time of year, around harvest time, huge orange and black clusters of monarch butterflies collected along the milkweed patches lining the roads and fields. Millions of butterflies migrating from Canada to Mexico before winter arrived. Trees would be completely covered with butterflies that tended to gather very close together. When the temperatures were too cold, especially early in the morning, they slept in clusters and closed their wings. So when you first saw them, they looked like dry leaves on the trees. When it got a little bit warmer, they opened their beautiful wings wide and flew around the forest, creating a magical scene. A monarch's brilliant coloring tells predators, don't eat me, I'm poisonous. <laughs> and it's true. The butterflies get their poisons from the milkweed plant, which is their only food source in the caterpillar stage. An animal that eats a monarch butterfly usually doesn't die, but it feels sick, sick enough to avoid monarchs in the future. The butterflies and bluebirds were happy about the vineyards, and the boys knew from school that grapes and grapevines had been one of the most important things in Augusta history. More than a hundred years earlier, German settlers had moved to Augusta and planted vineyards on many of the hillsides for making wine. When the laws changed in the 1920s, the vineyards were burned and people began using the hills for cattle pastures. But now the pastures were once again being planted with row after row of grape grapes. A few years ago, Augusta had even been named the first major wine making region in the entire United States. Missouri's vineyards had beat California and there was a very big party in town. The mayor made some exciting announcements at the party. This is one time that Missouri is first and California came in second. We're number one in the wine world now and nothing can change that. Just then, dad said, I heard the truck. Should we go see the grapes get crushed? The twins didn't mention they'd already been in the cellar all morning hunting lizards by flashlight. They jumped up and grabbed their jackets. How did dad always know exactly what they wanted to do? Well, you know, the dream of the Katy Trail did come true, of course. Like a ribbon, the Katy Trail stretches across Missouri from its easternmost point near the confluence of the Missouri and Mississippi rivers to Clinton, about an hour from Kansas City on the west. It covers countryside ranging from open farm fields to river's edge bluffs, the tree shaded tunnels. The Katy Trail stays close to the north bank of the Missouri River until it reaches Boonville, crossing the river as it heads south and then west.
towards Kansas City. So happy trails to everyone. And back to you, Caitlin. Thank you so much, Sherry. You really brought the monarchs and the bluebirds and all of the wonderful nature of Augusta, Missouri to life. So thank you so much for your storytelling and your interpretation. Our first guest for this afternoon is David Kelly. David currently serves as the deputy director for Missouri State Parks. David's working relationship with Pat Jones and the Katy Trail began in 1990 with the opening of Katy Trail State Park. Today, David will detail the acquisition and development of this unique state park and discuss its history, uses, and future initiatives. Take it away, David. Thank you for inviting me to participate. I've been very fortunate that my 32 year career with Missouri State Parks coincided with the acquisition and development of Katy Trail State Park. The Katy Trail, now stretching 290 miles across Missouri, is the longest developed rail trail in the United States. The Katy Trail has been inducted into the National Rail Trails Hall of Fame. It is part of the American Discovery Trail, and it's the longest non-motorized section of the Lewis and Clark National Historic Trail. Today, I wanna to look back on how the Katy Trail became the popular trail that we know today, and how the incredible vision and support of Ted and Pat Jones helped create a trail that attracts more than 400,000 annual visitors. When the Katy Railroad ceased operations in 1986, it provided the opportunity to convert the railroad corridor into a hiking and bicycling trail. The mechanism used to create the Katy was the Rails to Trails Act enacted by Congress in 1983 to preserve established railroad corridors for interim trail and future railroad use. Now we have an opportunity with the Katy Railroad filing for abandonment, we have a mechanism to create the trail with the Rails to Trails Act all we need was a visionary to make the Katy Trail possible. Ted and Pat Jones became interested in rail trail projects after a bike ride on a converted Wisconsin railroad trail and began lobbying the Missouri legislature to use land abandoned by the Katy Railroad for a similar project. Ted and Pat felt so strongly about creating the Katy Trail that they donated $200,000 of their own money to acquire the Katy Railroad corridor from Mockins to Sedalia from the Union Pacific Railroad and donated it to Missouri State Parks. Almost immediately after the Katy Corridor is donated to the state, a lawsuit was filed claiming the state railroad corridor should have been reverted to a local landowners. The case worked its way through the courts for more than three years. The U.S. Supreme Court ruled on a similar case from Vermont in February of 1990 and upheld the Rails to Trails Act. The Katy Trail could now be developed. Now that the court case was settled, there were a lot of public interest in developing the trail. When it was apparent that state funds to construct the Katy Trail were not gonna be available, Ted and Pat Jones stepped up again and donated $2 million to build pilot sections of the Katy Trail. The Western pilot section ran from Roachport to Jefferson City, and the Eastern pilot section ran from St. Charles to Marthasville. The idea of the pilot sections were to see how successful the trail was to help justify using state funds to complete the trail. With money donated from Ted and Pat Jones to build the trail, State Park crews started construction on the first section of Katy Trail in Roachport. In just over a month, the first section of the Katy Trail from Roachport to Huntsdale was ready to open. On April 28, 1990, more than a thousand people showed up on a cold and cloudy day in Roachport to watch Governor John Ashcroft, a strong supporter of the Katy Trail, Ted and Pat Jones, state officials, and many other dignitaries to cut the ribbon to officially open the Katy Trail. My fondest memory of that day was driving Ted and Pat Jones down the trail on the golf cart, maneuvering through a thousand people to get them to the site of the ribbon cutting ceremony. The ribbon cutting site is marked today by the Ted Jones Memorial, which was built to recognize Ted, who passed away a few months after the trail opened. That trip down the Katy Trail on opening day with Pat would be my first of many trips that I would take with Pat Jones over the next 28 years. Pat would participate in every major Katy Trail event and anniversary up until her death in 2018. On October 6, 1990, the first portion of trail for the Eastern Pilot Section is officially opened by Governor Ashcroft and construction of the two pilot sections continues. 
1991, Union Pacific Railroad donates a 33-mile stretch of the Katy Corridor between Sedalia and Clinton. The Katy Trail Corridor now stretches almost 240 miles from Mockins near St. Charles to Clinton. The two pilot sections proved to be very popular. Parking lots in Roachport and other trailhead communities had to be expanded to accommodate trail users. New trail businesses were opening in communities as fast as new sections of the trail would open. The popularity of the Katy Trail and the pilot sections exceeded expectations, and Missouri State Parks received approval to develop the entire Katy Corridor. Construction of the Katy Trail was halted by historic flooding on the Missouri River in 1993. With 185 miles of the trail running adjacent to the Missouri River, the historic flooding was devastating to the Katy Trail. Wooden trail bridges were washed away. State Park staff saved some of the bridges by using boats to haul them back to the trail. Much of the newly laid surface was washed away and most, and most of the developed sections of the Katy Trail lay ruined. Once the water receded, public support for rebuilding the trail was stronger than ever. Pat Jones stepped up again and donated additional funds to help rebuild the Katy Trail. State Park crews went to work and rebuilt the sections damaged by flooding. The two pilot sections were officially connected at North Jefferson Trailhead on September 29, 1996. Pat Jones threw the railroad switch that day, um, officially connecting the two pilot sections to create a continuous trail from Roachport to St. Charles. Today, the Katy Trail attracts uh, people who want to walk a few miles and many that want to ride the entire trail. The Katy Trail hosts many popular events. The annual Katy Trail ride attracts 350 people from more than 30 states on a five-day, four-night ride of the trail from Clinton to St. Charles. State Park staff host an annual Fall Colors tram tour on the Katy Trail between Roachport and McBain. The two-hour tour of the trail attracts more than 800 people to see the spectacular Fall Colors in Missouri River. In August of 2017, State Park staff hosted a total eclipse of the Katy bicycle ride, which attracted more than 500 people who got to experience a total solar eclipse while riding the trail from Roachport to Jefferson City. Another popular event on the Katy Trail are the Tuesdays on the Trail tram tours that happens in the spring and the fall along the corridor. These tram tours allow senior citizens and others who might not get to experience the Katy Trail an opportunity to get out on the trail. The 20th and 25th anniversaries of the Katy Trail provided an opportunity to celebrate and recognize Pat Jones for her contributions to the Katy Trail. The Pat Jones Bicycle and Pedestrian Bridge over the Missouri River in Jefferson City was named in Pat's honor, and a new picnic shelter at the North Jefferson Trailhead was named to honor Ed and Pat Jones. In December of 2016, the 47 mile Rock Island Spur Trail was added to Katy Trail State Park to fulfill Ted and Pat Jones's vision of a continuous trail across Missouri. At 290 miles across Missouri, the Katy Trail has become a major trail artery that have communities building trails to connect to the Katy. New highway bridges in Herman and Washington now feature walking and bicycle lanes to get people across the Missouri River to access the Katy Trail. The Katy Trail is one of the most popular and well-known state parks. It is a major attraction to bring people into Missouri, which brings economic benefit to communities along the trail. Ted and Pat Jones' investment to create the Katy Trail has really paid off for Missourians. Thank you for having me today. Thanks so much, David. Uh, it's great to hear the start of what is um, such a great attraction for, for our state and especially for the Missouri River area. Um, so with all of that said, with a little bit of background info on the history of the Katy Trail, how it was acquired and how it came to be, um, I'd like to introduce our next guests, um, who will be some familiar faces, because uh, our next guests are none other than Dan and Connie Burkhardt again. Dan and Connie are two of the authors of Growing Up With The River, uh, and they were our special guests just a few weeks ago. And they are here um, to represent Katie Land Trust, one of their organizations, and we'll discuss uh, their organization's conservation and advocacy efforts along the Katie Trail. Take it away. Wow, seeing David today and then hearing the stories, it's like a reunion. So I'm wearing my original shirt from the opening of the Katie Trail 30 years ago. Um, it's, it's 
so much the worse for wear. But, you know, when you think of like the hundreds and hundreds of thousands of bicycles on the trail from and the cyclists from all over the world, I mean, it's just this is the most exciting thing to have the Katy Trail right here in our state, the longest bike trail. And um, I also brought a photo that I took on the opening day of the trail. Little did I know 30 years ago that Dan and I were so involved in working alongside the Katy Trail almost every day of the week. So now I'm going to turn all of this over to Dan to share his stories. Well, it's uh, terrific to be on here and hear our words being read by Sherry and to see David talking about the great things that State Parks has done with the trail. Not only did they create the trail, but they've done uh, a remarkable job of dealing with uh, floods and other things and keeping it in the shape it's in. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about Ted Jones, who uh, David mentioned. I was working with Ted when the trail was created back in the 80s, and I spent a lot of time with him hearing about his vision for the trail and what he wanted to become, and certainly what State Parks has done has fulfilled that vision. And Ted and Pat uh, adopted the state really by creating this trail and it's been a wonderful legacy. And I'd like to show a couple photos of the trail if we could now. Uh, the thing that makes it unique is that it goes through so many different types of countryside. This shaded, beautiful spot uh, is, is somewhere probably along the Missouri River, just west of St. Louis. And it goes past cropland as well, farmland, and forests. Here's a couple of peddlers uh, riding with a soybean field in the background. And that's what gives it its remarkable appeal to people. It has a lot of wildlife that can be seen along it. And uh, the stories we tell in our book are about the different changes along the river valley since the settlement of the area. And one of the things that has happened is uh, habitat has been damaged in a lot of places. And one of the uh, creatures that suffered from that habitat loss was bluebirds. Bluebirds nested in tree cavities. And back in the old days, there were many, many dead trees standing around in places where bluebirds could live. But as time marched on and the fields grew larger and the old dead trees got removed, their nesting places disappeared. So in this chapter, we talk about people building bluebird boxes. And 30 years ago, that began in earnest, and it has really brought the bluebird back. And that's a state bird of Missouri, so that's an important thing to us. And the stories in our book are all about change, the change that's happened along the river. Initially, there were bears and wolves and all kinds of wild creatures. And they were displaced by the settlement of uh, Europeans. A lot of Germans came to the area. Soon after they came, steamboats came to the river valley. And the steamboats were then displaced by trains and railroads. And the Katy Railroad was created in the 1890s. And by the 1980s, the Katy Railroad was out of business, making room for the Katy Trail. So the stories that we like to tell are those about the changes in the river valley. And some of those changes have been for the good and some of them uh, probably not so good. And what we try to get the readers of our book to focus on are the changes that uh, have been made that had to be corrected over time. And uh, what we want to avoid in the future are changes that are detrimental to the landscape along the Katy Trail. And that's what gives the Katy Trail its special appeal is that it goes through farmland and forest and along the river and under bluffs. And it wouldn't be the same if the Katy Trail ran through subdivisions. And instead of running under bluffs, it went under highways. And so the Katy Land Trust was created to get people to think about the value of preserving this area, to get people to think about what can be done to ensure that the beauty that we all experience out there today 
stays in the future. And one thing that we did uh, was buy an old general store along the trail. It used to be along the railroad. This is the Piers store that's on the Katy Trail today. And that's the way it looked in 1950 when the last steam train came down the Katy, tra or the Katy Railroad. And we bought the store when it was in danger of being torn down. It was built for the arrival of the Katy Railroad in 1896. And back in its day, it was the Target, the Walmart of its neighborhood. It sold everything and it was the center of commerce. But by 2012, it had closed and we were afraid it was going to be demolished and uh, a piece of history was going to be lost. So this is a place that we use to talk about the value of conserving things and keeping things that are representative of the culture and the landscape of the area. So I'd like to invite all of you to come out to the Piers store some weekend afternoon this fall and uh, enjoy this piece of conserved history and enjoy the Katy Trail. And uh, our motto at the Katy Land Trust is this. I think you can see this button. This indicates that asphalt is the last crop. And it means that once things are developed, once things are paved over and subdivided, they don't come back. They don't come back for enjoyment by the public and they don't come back to produce crops and the other things that we need and that wildlife needs. So uh, we hope you have the chance to get out on the trail this fall and enjoy the things that we enjoy out there so much. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dan and Connie. Uh, Connie, we loved that you brought some memorabilia with you, the t-shirt and the picture. That's so great uh, to know um, how invested you guys are in the in the conservation of the area along the Katy Trail. Uh, thanks for one again, once again stepping up to the plate to represent uh, both your wonderful book and help us tell the stories and better interpret the themes in the book. Um, so thanks to both um, David and Dan and Connie as well. Thanks to Sherry. Um, but also thanks to everyone who registered for the event uh, for this series uh, in advance. Um, with each chapter, we are hosting a little giveaway uh, to folks who registered. So today, um, our winner will receive a train whistle in honor of the chapter's theme of the Katy Trail. Uh, the whistle can even teach you how to make different train whistle sounds and how those different sounds are used to communicate with other trains. So a super fun uh, little giveaway for all of you um, with youngins or those of you, of course, young at heart. You know, train whistles are a lot of fun. I remember playing with them when I was little. Uh, Lisa and I were talking about um, this as a gift this or as a giveaway this week and how much fun we used to have with these when we were young. So, uh, so keep an eye out on your email um, if you have registered in advance for the series. Uh, you could get an email saying that uh, you are the lucky winner this week. Um, if you would like to receive uh, regular series updates, including the links to these videos, uh, fun book activities, and raffle prizes, visit mohumanities.org. Um, I don't see any questions from anybody in our comments, so I'll go ahead and conclude our program today. Um, thank you again for everyone, first of all, for your patience as we worked through um, some technical difficulties earlier, but I'm glad everything went off without a hitch. Uh, and thanks to everyone who tuned in today. This is chapter eight of Growing Up with the River. And special thanks to HEC TV for helping us present this program. We could not have done this without you. And to Sherry Norfolk uh, for our being our featured storyteller and to our guest speakers, of course, David Kelly and then Dan and Connie Burkhart. Um, so for our kids activity this week, right, or real quick before we end today, um, this chapter of course discusses the migration of the monarch butterflies throughout the region. So today's activity will be a tutorial on how to craft your very own popsicle stick monarch butterfly. Uh, we will post the activity in the comment section of this video on Facebook and also on our website. So have a lot of fun with that uh, with your kiddos this week. Uh, we hope to see you all back next week for chapter nine. We are rapidly approaching the end of the series uh, of the 10 part series. So uh, please tune in next week. And uh, thanks again, everybody, and have a great evening.